Kia ora. Welcome to another episode where we share relevant content to help tourism and hospitality businesses thrive. Join us each week as we share insights and hear from industry specialists. We hope you enjoy this week's episode and to stay up to date, why don't you click the subscribe button to get notified when a new video drops. Now we welcome you to sit back and enjoy this week's episode. Heather Collins from Creative Kiwi Travel. Heather, welcome. How are you? I'm good, thank you. And crazy. Yes, I know. I mean, we've known each other for for a while and um, crazy quite often comes up, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, they sort of go together. <laughs> Heather, crazy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but before we dig into the craziness, do you want to tell us a little bit about Creative Kiwi Travel? Well, Creative Kiwi Travel um, stemmed from um, Pacific Travel going into hibernation in March this year. And um, the company went into hibernation and I was like, oh, God, what will I do now? This is all I've ever done is sell New Zealand to overseas yeah. clients. So um, I thought, oh, I'll be able to get a job doing reservations or something. I really don't mind. So I phoned John Gregory and asked if he had a reservations job going. Bless him, he said, yes, I do, Heather. He said, but I can't pay you your true worth. You should do it on your own. And oh, bless that, him. Yeah. And at that point, I was like, hmm. Maybe I could. Maybe I couldn't, but maybe I could. And what have I got to lose by giving it a go? So I did all the sums and um, talked to my very good friend, Tracy, at Directional Tourism, oh, who, thank you. <laughs> who guided me uh, and mentored me through the ups and downs and pitfalls and what you have to do, and it is a big, it's a big step doing your own business starting from scratch. But with the help of Tracy and John, I had the confidence to do it. Um, also, I was probably fortunate that I was at the stage in our lives where I didn't have to work to put bread and butter on the table. Mm -hmm. um, so that that made a big difference as well. Um, so my husband still goes to work and he still brings in the same amount of money as he did three years ago. So, you know, there's that sense of security which helped as well. Yeah. But So, yes, yeah, started from scratch, 1st of April, Creative Kiwi Travel went live and it was slow and it didn't start fast enough for me and things weren't happening and I was like, holy crap, what have I done? So now we're just working through it. Now, see, I, lo I love this because we're, we're going to dig a little bit more into your journey, but when you started, uh, I remember the panic phone call, do I, don't I, do I, don't I, do I, don't I? And, and, and this is exactly what people that go out and do their, their own businesses go through, don't they? You just, you, you, you're taunting with yourself whether or not you have the ability to start something new. And I ha and it were, I remember the day that I made that phone call to you, it was a Sunday and I was like, I don't think I can do this. This is too hard. And, and you just talked me through it and, and yeah. bit the bullet. Yeah, yeah. And I think what's been beautiful from, from the outside looking in is just how proactive you have been with your business. Now, you have a little bit of a niche. Talk us through your, your I guess, your client mix that you focus on. <laughs> yeah, so, I, you know, ideally my background of inbound for 35 years is gearing and I've got strong contacts in the North American market. So ideally, that's where I should go, but they weren't coming. Mm. Um, and so I was probably, I was fortunate that the area we live in has got a lot of elderly people. And I was talking to our neighbour one day and he said, oh, 
I'm on the Grey Power Committee, and I think there's a need for people to arrange tours for the likes of us around New Zealand. I was like, holy heck, okay. All right, so then I advertised in Grey Power, got two people. I was horrified, but apparently that's still quite good. So in my database of one, which was my neighbour, went to three. <laughs> <laughs> so it doubled. Um, and then uh, I started talking to people and at in retirement villages. And the retirement villages are very, very hard to get into. They have their own activities coordinators who like to do their own plans and take the credit for it. Um, but I was then, so six weeks into it, I was offered an activities coordinator's job at a retirement village. And I was like, no, I've just put all this money into setting up this business. I'm not going to walk away and come work for you, but let me come in and talk to your people about what I'm doing and I'll bring you some scones. So, mm -hmm. and I went with a batch of 40 scones with jam and cream talk to these old people and uh, elderly, shot, sorry, elderly. <laughs> and they, you know, then all of a sudden I had 12 people on the database. Um, and then it was word of mouth and just doing little day trips. Um, and then I'd contact another retirement village and say, oh, look, would I be able to come in and talk to you about the tours I've got going? I'll bring scones. Yes, sure. So I went. I probably, for once a week, for about six weeks, I went around retirement villages with my batch of scones, and and now my database is at 172. Um, <gasps> and there that, are that's like real people who wow with me, and then they sell yeah. they tell somebody else, and now it's just growing through word of mouth, um, and. And a little bit of Facebook as well. Wow, the power of scones, hey? Scones. It's all about the scones. And that's what I say to them. When you come on my tours, you'll get a nice hot scone as soon as you sit on the seat in the coach. And this is one of and the when I, I remember that from our day when, you know, let's confess, we used to work together many moons yeah. ago. The cheese scrolls that you have used to make in the office, I was addicted to those. You just yeah. have a knack for cooking. Yeah. And, and you know, in the tourism sector, uh, we are a sucker for, for, for food, food, and, food and, and drinks. Oh, and the elderly are. If they think they're getting something for nothing, oh, my God, they're right in there. Right in there. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and in relation to food, there has been some mistakes made on tours thinking yep. that the old people, they won't eat much. Uh, wrong. They eat everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so talk, talk us through the first tour that you, you did. Um, so the first overnight tour was just, oh, my God, it was terrible. So <laughs> it was the longest night, which was on the shortest day, and we went to Tekapo. I had 15 people in a 19-seater coach and my husband, Michael, drove. And and that's that's a really good that's a really good thing that we can do. He takes time off work and he drives and the banter between us, the the elderly love it. Because we're just we're not telling dad jokes or anything, but we're sort of digging at each other the whole way and they just <laughs> chuckle away and love it. Anyway. So we, we headed off, but, you know, you had to get, I had to make sure that I had a step for them to get on and off the coach. I had to have an emergency kit that had a comprehensive first aid kit. I made sure I got my passenger license so that if something happened to the driver, I could drive. I had to make sure that there was, you know, um, some some water in the emergency kit and cable ties and some duct tape and just anything that you think they'd need. So I've got this big plastic container now that just goes with me on the coach. But, you know, you've got to go out and buy all that stuff. And um, yeah. 
and I hadn't really thought about it until, you know, two days before we left. So, but anyway, we got that all loaded up and, um, and they, um, and we went and picked them all up from their places where they lived. Um, that was the first and last time we did that because it means that the other people are in the coach the whole time. So you've mm. got, so the first person you pick up is actually an hour on tour and they haven't gone anywhere. So mm. now, now I've learned that we just do super shuttle when I cost that in. Um, so we went down to Tekapo. There had been immense flooding the week before. So I wasn't sure if we were going to get there. Um, there was no talk of COVID closures. You know, that was there was no COVID here then. So I didn't have that worry. But there was road closures and the um, Ashburton Bridge was closed. So we had to go a different way. But it was okay. That was that was all right. That was fine. Um, but the hotel in Tekapo was just terrible. And... Um, it was cold and I'd asked that they had the heating on and they didn't and they said they had electric blankets and they didn't and when we got there they said oh you're booked in for dinner but um the restaurant's not open tonight I was like oh my god <laughs> um <laughs> so I found a lovely restaurant just down the road and um said to the clients because I looked at the menu and I was like you know the average is about $30 a head for a main so I'd costed it at $45 so I thought oh instead of giving them a set menu at the last minute they could just do a la carte holy crap they all had three courses oh. <laughs> <laughs> their dinner was twice as it was like $90 a head oh god <laughs> but after saying that, though, because the hotel was so bad, they just raved about that dinner. So it actually... Oh, um, yeah. So, yeah, you got to sort of add those things up. And then um, it was only a one-night stay. Then we headed back home and went to Arari Gorge Station, which is just this um, lovely historic station that nobody had been to before. You know, tours really don't go there. The lady was unbelievable. It bucketed down, like bucketed down. You wouldn't believe how wet it was. Like we couldn't drive the bus into the paddock because it would have got stuck. So they had to transport us in the tractor in bits, you know, four people at a time. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> um. They all loved that whole adventure of it. And yeah. then we went to this lovely cafe for lunch where they were paying for their own lunch, just as well. Um, and it was somewhere off the main road, so they didn't even know that cafe existed. And it was beautiful, and they made them feel welcome, and they all bought enough food to take home for dinner. <laughs> so um, I felt that I, I learned that they were really food orientated. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I also had baking to hand round on the coach, but we drove, I always try to come back a different way to what, so we're not backtracking on mm -hmm. the same road, but because there was so much flooding, the roads were closed, so we had to come back yeah. the main way, but every single one of those people has rebooked on another tour. Wow. So, it, it, yeah. I imagine that they wouldn't have even known what was going on behind the scenes. Oh, they had no idea. Oh, my God, I was stressed to the max. <laughs> Absolutely stressed to the max. I had a lady fall over. You know, just... Yeah. Just, so everything that could possibly go night. wrong on your first tour in one night. All right. So so you move on from there. You've done, <laughs> you've done your one-nighters. Talk us through kind of what's been filling your program now because okay, one so, tour um, is not enough to make you survive. No, so I've worked out that I have to do, that a, ideally, if I can do a multi-day tour every six weeks, mm -hmm. that will be enough to keep me going. Um, I've also secured the contract with a church group, which is no money making, trust me. It's a um, community service gesture, really. Yeah. 
taking 48 people the first Wednesday of every month on a day trip somewhere around Christchurch. So I cost myself out at $2 per person. So, you know, there's no money to be made, but yeah. there's, there's 300 people in that fellowship group. And I travel oh, wow. with them and I sell Creative Kiwi Travel while I'm on that coach. And this is really this is this is interesting because you are you, you're you're getting into these little niches, aren't you? These little places that yeah, they need someone like you, someone to raise them up, take them out, show them. I guess Absolutely. you're showing them parts Absolutely. of their own backyard that they yeah, didn't even I've know existed. Deal, like that one, I've had to deal with a committee, and that's yep. really hard. So mm. some committee members, why do we need Heather? And others are going, oh, my God, we need Heather. So I yeah. had to sell myself to them, even though it was basically voluntary. Yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but a couple of their tours had to cancel. Um, but that's no, you know, that's no big deal. Um, so, and it's half a day. That, you know, it's half a day. Yeah, so w one thing that I know from the book, the work that we've done is that you are an amazing itinerary builder. So you come up with places that people don't even think of. You you uncover little hidden gems. So what yep. would you say would be your the favourite place you've been to so far with your groups? Oh, I think um, Lake Oha, the lodge yeah. at Lake Oha. Um, but, of course, we had drama then too. Nothing runs smoothly for Heather, I have to say. Nothing. So that's where we go back. That's where we go back to the crazy. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, this was my first. Uh, this is a seven-day tour. You know, so we're talking okay. big time stuff. Once mm -hmm. again, Michael was driving, and and we learnt that people like to leave from home. So we had the bus here parked in our driveway. And the super shuttle dropped people off here so that they could go to the bathroom and, you know, they could just wait for the others in the comfort in front of the fire. So then they get on the coach and we leave on time. That's always good. And we get on, we head south and we get onto the Rakaia River Bridge and there was a fatality and there was an accident and we were the third vehicle. So I'm oh, sitting no. in, in the guide seat. I can see, I can see what what happened. A motorcyclist crossed the white line and hit a sheet truck. So, you know, it was it didn't pass anybody. He just went and hit it. So then I've got 14 people in this bus with a trailer on the back who, who probably saw what I saw, but I tried not to. Oh, it was horrible. And um, so I got the baking out and handed round the biscuits. And <laughs> but we had to wait for the police because they wanted to question us. So we were yeah. two hours sitting on the bridge. So I got them wow. out and told them that they could stand on the side and look at the river, but not to leave, leave the bus. So that was all right. Then the camera crews are coming over, and I was like, my God, we have got a Pacific Tourways coach and it's going to be on TV. I better let them know that, that we are fine. So I so I phoned them, I text them and said we're fine, but the coach will probably be on TV. Then yeah. um so two hours later, we back Mike backed off the <laughs> backed off the bridge and we 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 were still only 40 minutes from home. I'm like, oh, oh. so now we're really late. And um, so I was like, these people need to sort of gather their thoughts again. And I I certainly did, but they didn't know that. And so we went the back road and we went to the Hirata Cafe and I gave them, I shouted them a cup of coffee and promptly went to the bathroom and threw up. Oh. <gasps> Then we were in traffic to get across the bridge on the alternative bridge. So we were in a 14-kilometre line of traffic. 
but they needed to pee, so we need to stop at the cafe. Uh, and um, uh, Heather. <laughs> so that was all, so we got we got to Geraldine at three thirty for lunch. But I'd made lunch for them, so it was in the so we already had it. So I handed oh, it around in the bus. So I'd made them their lunch. So that was lucky. Um, and then we still went, we still did everything we intended to do to get to Lake Oha, but then we struck another accident. A caravan had tipped over, so we were held up for 40 minutes there. So the bacon came out again. <laughs> um, so we got to Lake Oha at half past eight at night. Now, um, and it was stinking hot. And of course, it's not hot in New Zealand usually at that time of year. And so they couldn't turn the heating off because it's hot water heating. Um, and so it was so hot that we all slept with our doors open and everything. They gave us, they held our dinner up because I'd let them know. They put wine on the table for us, which was really fine. Um, and then and then I heard this noise outside and I go outside and here's one of my ladies totally start na naked. Naked as looking at the stars. And I'm like, <laughs> I have to deal, this is probably what I have to deal with this, don't I? Yes, I do. So I said, oh, come on, come on, come back to your room. And so I took her back to her room and she said, oh, oh. I was just so hot. I was getting ready for bed and I thought I should go out and look at the stars. And I said, well, you forgot to put your pyjamas on. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, and this is all in one day. This was all in one day. And oh. then that lady lost her handbag at least seven times every day. So I've had to say to her family that she can't travel with us unless a family member travels with her again. But after saying that, Lake Ohau was just beautiful. But I don't know if that's because it was like, oh, thank God we're here. Um, and, of course, and I thought, well, Nothing actually worse than that can go on unless somebody dies. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah knock on wood. I knock on wood. Yeah. It's really yeah. unfortunate. A, 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 you know, whilst we're on that topic, I mean, a death is never easy, but they happen. They just happen. They do just happen. As, just as accidents happen uh, and people yeah. slip over or, or, you know, fall ill, they just happen. And it, it really comes down to how you, as the operator, can handle that situation and manage and, it. And, and all those people have booked on the tour for February, every single one of oh, them. Oh, wow. And I saw oh, one wow. of them yesterday, um, and she said, oh, Heather, you're just so calm. And I'm like, yeah, no, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. I love this. I love this rawness about you just telling us, you know, exactly how it is when you're oh. doing the tours. And and it's it's I imagine it's like, you know, a, a duck really calm on top, but the legs are spinning underneath. No one knows oh, exactly God. what's yes. going yeah, but on. Then, then fabulous stuff happened. Like we went to um, St. Bethan's, to the pub at St. Bethan's, and I told them we were coming, um, but I told them that a day out. So <laughs> the lady goes, do you realise that you booked it for tomorrow? I said, oh, my God, I'm so sorry, but that was all right. Um there was this man sitting at the bar and I said to him, I said, are you, are you a local? Yes, lived here all my life. And so he stood up and talked to the group about living in St. Bathins. <gasps> wow. And that is such a unique part of, you know, Central. Uh, it's an amazing said, part. Uh, the bluebell, bluebells are out at um, Crayburn. You need to go and look at the bluebells. And I said, I've never heard about these bluebells. And he said, oh, yes, you need to go and have a look. So we did. And Michael took this, the bus down this little one-lane road. And there was just this oasis of four acres of bluebells. Wow. And this, it was just sensory overload. It was the most fabulous thing I've ever seen. Totally I think for... I think for all of the madness that goes on on your tours, you just happen to experience some amazing and wonderful things personally and also for your groups because that's just like a gem, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It was fabulous. It was fantastic. 
Yeah. And then I also try and get locals to come and talk to the group. Mm. Because I'm probably fortunate. I know lots of people all around, you know, and mm. they're just as crazy as me. And they're very happy <laughs> to stand up and talk about living in their area. Uh, I'm sorry, Heather, but I can't not smile in talking to you. You just, you just, you just, there's just something about it. Hey, look, what would you, you know, this, how long have you been running the business for now? Is it, we started it this year. April, didn't we? It was, April Fool's Day. First of April. Yep, yeah, because it, it's not a joke, it's still going. <laughs> now, what would you say is your secret to the su- success with this this business? I mean, what is it do you feel that you do that, that's different that brings people back? personal it's Mm. personal it's all about them it's all about them every single person on my database has been invited to come here for a cup of tea and a piece of Christmas cake on the 16th of December that's the key just don't say your address because you might get a few more people if you uh... (laughs) (laughs) oh yeah but more the merrier yeah (laughs) yeah now, if if you were to give any advice, because you know, there's a lot of people out there that have had a hard year, but there's people contemplating that have been in tourism, they've lost their jobs in tourism, they're not quite sure what to do. You know, what what kind of advice would you give them if they were kind of thinking about starting a tourism business, like just like you were, but haven't done it yet? What kind of advice would you give someone? I think it's really important to think in your mind that you're not going to make any money in the first 12 months. So then that pressure's gone. I think it is also important to pay somebody for what you don't want to do. Mm. Because you can't be good at everything. And when you have your own business, you're doing everything. Yep. And I think it's really important to actually pay somebody for what you don't want to do or can't do or yep. don't enjoy doing because your time is precious. Yeah, and that's something that a lot of business owners forget to take into account is the value of their own time. Yeah, yeah, because this doesn't feel like work to me. Putting an itinerary together does not feel like work to me, but no one else can do it. So you've got to Mm. remember, you charge your time out because they can't do it. They've come Mm. to you. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's interesting because there are so many things that people need to do now. I mean, if we look back at running a business 10, 15 years ago or even starting a tourism business, it's it's kind of different from then to now. I mean, digital plays such a strong part and and you know you, you put your hand up and knew straight away I have to have a website even yeah. though my market may not be looking at it I have to have a website and and that's a really critical piece for a lot of people and regardless of your ability you know I I, I know and we're going to tell everyone I know that we worked with you on your website and now you can edit your website you know it's you've got the yes, tools I'm not you've really got good the ability at it. now <laughs> Um, I'm not very good at it, but I think I'm going to get somebody to do that for me, but somebody who understands me because I want me to come through on the website. Perfect. Yeah, and that's it, and that's important. And that's also another thing that is important to make sure that you continue to have that tone of voice that reflects you the whole way through, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, because I'm selling Cause, me. So, and, and let's go back, because when you first started on social media, who was doing your <laughs> posts? Who was? Yeah, it was Me. Alistair, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, Alistair Alistair's, was. Yeah. Alistair, your, uh, your son started. Your son. Yes. Um, and then somehow or another, I put a, a post up about going down to Riverstone Castle on a day trip in, to Omaru, and it reached 13,000 people. To this day, I don't know how. Still don't know how. Well, it could have been a combination of it posted it at the right time, right words, right look. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Who, who knows? knows? Who Most knows? of them are about it, 300 now. But yeah. Oh, that's 
And that's great. That's absolutely great. That's great. So Heather, look, we've 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 hit our time, and I would I would love to to keep talking because I, I imagine that you have quite a lot of stories to tell, a lot okay. of stories to tell, and you're only you're not even one year in, and you're successfully running single day tours, multi day tours. You've connected with these groups. You're now taking over these groups. I just imagine that that we are going to see big things from you over the next 12 to 18 months. But I've got one last question for you. How do you feel now knowing that the borders are going to open? How do you feel that's going to change? Is that going to change anything for you or is it going to uh, basically 